the story commences with a sudden burst of bright light illuminating the screen. A cursor, reminiscent of a computer interface, hovers over what appears to be a battlefield, signaling that the unfolding events are situated within a game. Still, the conflict continued and it is a fierce battle between two factions. One, venerating a god named Nebula and the other devoted to a god named Hegemonia. Each side engages in intense warfare, showcasing unique specialties and strategies, and the supposed gods wield control over their respective believers. Akin to players maneuvering pieces in a game of chess. However, the player's freedom surpasses that of chess, allowing them to unleash formidable actions such as launching nuclear attacks on the battlefield, which the player Nebula had approved, launching several nuclear warheads to his opponent's side. But even with this, player Hegemonia wasn't phased, as he had anticipated this already. Being tower-like structure embedded with faith as a form of an interceptor missile, which revealed to be super effective, as the missiles instantly were blown up, but that was within his calculations. The enemy's missile interception system couldn't keep up with him, as a single one was left unscathed, and it was heading right to the center of the enemy's imperial palace, where countless of orcs were just praying diligently for their god to save them, and if this was reality, prayers would be meaningless. But this wasn't reality. This was lost world, and faith and prayers in this world always produce meaningful results. Just like how a spirit just suddenly materialized because of the faith of the people, stopping the nuclear attack from landing on their territory. However, Nebula wasn't surprised as he expected this cheap opponent to be using the current meta, the Holy Oak strategy, which Hegemonia the second placer in the server ranking was openly proud of, and therefore even mocked Nebula because of his failed attempt, but Nebula couldn't blame Hegemonia for coming out with such confidence, because this was an overpowered strategy all along. As it is easy to increase the population due to the nature of the orc race, and as the number of believers increased, faith resources were also quickly acquired, science, technology, and culture were then gained through invasion. This was a good strategy that constantly received good reviews because the great amount of faith accumulated, and the large number of orcs resulted in an advantage in war, and the fact that the opponent chose the sky as their realm meant that they were aware of and took into account Nebula's choice of skill, the science development skill. This prevent him from using majority of his aerial arsenal, they even prepared behind the scene to counter his nuclear attack, seeing that they can summon a spirit chain. Apostle with a high caliber at such a fast rate. However, Nebula remained unimpressed as this was all too obvious for him, so even if his opponent has large territory that even reached the skies, it is still just a sky above their heads, so he just need to have a weapon beyond it. And because of this realization, he had prepared an AI-operated military satellite made from ancient relics, equipped with the rods from God, even Hegemonia was shocked to see that. Nebula has this weapon, as he didn't expect after a nuclear weapon. He still has a high-mass weapon more destructive than the last. With this, Hegemonia could only scream at Nebula to stop, but Nebula doesn't give a shit to what his opponents wanted, and therefore he just let his attack continue. It is just a few tungsten rod after all. Still, Hegemonia attempted to block it with his spirit chain apostle, but Nebula was confident that it would fail. With the rod adding up the accumulated gravitational acceleration, it has the speed approximately 10 times the speed of sound, and with this, the rod just went through the apostle like it was butter, and when it made contact on the ground, it made such a devastating sight as it penetrated the ground with such force on par with a nuclear weapon, just without the nuclear after effects. But still, the emperor was now dead, the underground temple collapsed along with the imperial palace, and therefore the faith that Hegemonia built will disappear, and after that happens, the apostles will also disappear. With this, Nebula won, and was still the number one ranker of the game, but just like any player would do. Before he leaves, he told Hegemonia GG, skill issue, however, Hegemonia couldn't accept such outcome as he was a sore loser after all, and so he demanded another round. And this bitch even has the audacity to proclaim that this will be the beginning of his winning streak, but just like before, Nebula remained unimpressed, and so he stoically just declined Hegemonia's request. Still, he can't help but wonder if Hegemonia has still few tricks up his sleeves, as he still strongly believed to win against him. 
however, being the number one ranker for a while, he knew all too well that there was nothing that hegemonia could do that would surprise him, as the game itself has nothing new to offer, and the fact that he was able to complete all the achievements available and maintained, first place in the rankings was enough of a proof that the game is nothing more to offer to him, and so, slowly but surely, he decided to quit playing. To his surprise, before he could leave, a message suddenly popped up on his screen, which initially irritated him at first, because who on earth is bothering him at this time of day? Still, curiosity got the best of him, and so he opened the message, only to be met with praise, congratulating him for having the only one who has cleared all achievements. And the game really appreciated that he enjoyed Lost World so far, but seeing such message only confused him, he could only see these things when the game would announce an end of service, but due to the game's popularity, it seems like it wouldn't be the case, so he clicked more to see what's more of this sudden message. To his surprise, it revealed to him that the game he had been playing was just an early beta access, and would be scheduled to be officially released, so as the top player Nebula, they give him a rare opportunity to enjoy the game before official service, and because he is on the pursuit of seeing more of this game would offer, he accepted their request. And with this, he was instantly sucked in a sea of codes, where binary codes float endlessly. But not even a moment passed, darkness ensues soon after. After that, the empty space began reveal the countless of stars that occupied it. Under those said stars was a familiar figure, it was Nebula's game avatar, opening his eyes, light shines mirroring the magnificent sight before him, a view far from what he was used to, beautiful but it felt like it was a ruin of some sort, where stone columns in a rugged style reminiscent of Greek temples circled the place, but the strange thing was that the sky was black, even though the horizon was visible. This could only mean that there is no atmosphere, obviously, one wouldn't be able to breathe. Without an atmosphere, and looking at himself he recognizes that he was in the body the character he was playing, and so he got up thinking that all of this was just a vivid dream. Unexpectedly, a mysterious figure approached from behind and informed him that it is not. And he is here because he has been chosen, but before he could formulate a response. The enigmatic woman, draped in a flowing robe, warmly welcomed him, addressing him by his real name, Sun Wan, after that, she introduced herself as Alden. This instantly raised questions of how this figure got to know his real name, who is this woman, more than that, what does she meant by being chosen, but before he could find answers. Shadows suddenly begun to appear before his eyes, which surprised him at first, but he knew the silhouettes of the shadows were those of ordinary people. He knew this because the shadows were also surprised and looking around just like he was, and noticing that Nebula was already aware of what the shadows truly were. Alden explained why they were covered in mystery, and that is because they all come from the same world, and since there is a chance of them knowing one another, they have covered everyone in shadows for a fair game but this doesn't explain why they were here exactly. And so she decided to get straight to the point. She raised her hand, and revealed to them the earth, but looking at it closer, the continents of this planet was different from what earth had, it was a view of the place they have seen many times, so it was undoubtedly the planet of the lost world, and in this vast lost world, they the players had become a true god. This surprised everyone, even if Nebula couldn't hear any sound from other players, he felt it very well. There are people who felt embarrassed of how cringeworthy the statement was, the dialogue. Felt like it came from an edgelord. Still, since they got nothing better to do, they continued to listen what Alden had to say, so Alden told them that the lost world they knew of isn't a world that simply exists. In the game, it's a land abandoned by the gods due to an incident in the past. On that planet, a once brilliant civilization blossomed, different races lived in harmony. However, for unknown reasons, the gods left it, and so now it's time for new gods, and the game that they played was created with the purpose of finding suitable new candidates for that planet, just by trying. They can become god. It's essentially like the lost world they had played, where at first, only low class creatures will believe in them, but if they succeed in increasing their number of followers, they may become the one and only god of the planet, and the world becomes theirs, and they'll be able to do everything they want, and all the desires they have ever dreamed of it is feasible as a god in this world. This was a chance of a lifetime, but things are just too good to be true. 
he felt that there was something Alden still wasn't addressing, and so Nebula asks the precaution of giving up now, to his surprise, if they give up, they will just go back to their daily life and would lose their memories of this place, which was pretty convenient. And so Nebula asks if this was still the same if he gives up mid-challenge, but just as expected, they were not so generous to let them do that. This begged Nebula to follow up a question, asking what happens if he is defeated by other gods, and Alden just simply answered that, if that happens, he will met a godly end. And they will welcome it. This is what Nebula had expected. If it was a game where the victor could gain everything, it stood to reason that the participants would have to risk their lives, and should this real-world competition follow the game. The lost world. One might have to risk more than their life, but this just only made him smile. The exhilarating feeling of putting their lives at risks made this game more interesting for him, and so there was no reason for him to give up now. Now that was clarified to all the players. Alden asks the people who plans to give up, to step up now and notify her, while for those who want to take on the challenge, she presented cards for them to choose, where it can present them a small area where they will begin their journey, seeing this. Nebula recognized that it's really just like in the game, the means to start the game with. Selecting a small area. However, his trains of thought was disrupted as he noticed that other people are giving. Up already. It started with a few people, but soon other followed as well. With this, Nebula started to analyze how many people was left. Obviously the starting number of the people that had transported in this place was also. The same amount of player of the lost world could allow in a single planet for a single match, and it was 32, that means the final number of people left was 27, which was still a lot of competition to be the only god of this world. However, his trains of thought were disturbed yet again, by the mysterious woman asking him to choose a card first. This could only mean that the order of which they can chose was the same order of their rank, and so he did the honors to be the first one to choose, but as he lifted the card, his eyes grew larger as he was in shock to see that he got this small area of all things. Still, before he could even say anything, he was instantly transported into the lost world and into his designated small area, where a beautiful greenery and a stream of river could be seen, and within those rivers, different creatures inhabits the place. However, the inhabitants were more different from what's on earth. As the supposedly frog actually has a well-toned body that could be easily called daddy. Of how lean he looks, still, it got a heart of a golden retriever, as it was just happy to catch some fish. In the midst of this, a blue butterfly emanating with mysteriousness just casually passed by them. This butterfly turned out to be Nebula's familiar. This is what he got from those cards. The small area of insects. It wasn't insects in a strict sense, but rather a category that covered, to some extent, multiple arthropods and crustaceans. But among the 32 small areas that could have been selected first, insects wasn't very well evaluated and actually had the lowest winning rate, according to actual data. But he didn't let this affect him, since everything depend on how one use it. It is even backward compatible with birds, so it is quite useful in the beginning. However, another problem arise, the starting point where he was at, is the eastern end of the continent. This place had a disadvantage in advancing. This means that the battles don't happen pretty often in the beginning, so gaining benefits through early engagement is near impossible to accomplish, and therefore an aggressive strategy like he was used to won't be viable. In that sense, he just needs to focus on finding a suitable species as a starter, and a race that eats insect would be a good starting race. Like those frogmen, for example. But what bothers him about this tribe was its numbers. And that is because Lost World enables a god to exert influence on creatures equal to the level of faith it possesses. However, the bigger the group, the less little miracles were cared about. So even though it may be a benefit to gain a big tribe in the beginning, there was a risk of vainly consuming all ten faith points without seeing any result. And this amount of faith points is way too small to have any influence on the group of frogmen. With this, he looked for another group nearby, leading him to wander to a more desolated place, where a small group of lizard men was wandering around aimlessly. This species was also a great candidate, since lizard men also eat insects, and they can survive in such extreme condition unlike the frogmen, so he was more compelled to locate them closer. 
this made him noticed of how their number had dwindled a little, which was actually great. As it was just the right amount that Nebula wanted, to his surprise, the group even contained the sick and elderly. With this, he realized that this lizard men came from the original group, and the reason why they were out in the desert because they must have been pushed out in a power struggle. And at the back of this small group, there was a young, wounded lizard man. This was such a perfect setup for Nebula, because the more he feels abandoned by the world, the more difficult and tired he would feel, and with this, he will put all his hopes up for a small miracle to happen, but he is such a fragile being. Still, with an opportunity like this, he decided to go through in supporting this wounded lizard. A few moments later, the group of lizard men continued to roam this barren land. Exhaustion was noticeable within their expressions. Fortunately for them, they have somehow encountered a wounded gazelle on their path, which they didn't hesitate to charge towards, and because it had been a long time since they saw meat, they act like savages, and consumed the gazelle in frenzy. While the wounded and the elderly just sit on the side as this happened, and just a moment more, the once lively gazelle vanished in an instant. All that was remained from it were its bones, but still, the healthy lizard man was planning on consuming this until the very end. As the bone marrow on these bones is also very delicious. However, before they could do that, another one of their kind, Chowl, snatched the bones and told them that they already have enough, and they should leave these remains to those who can't hunt. Even though it was just mere bones, the injured and elderly was thankful of it, and they don't even blame the others, as they fully understand their circumstances. But unlike the weak lizards, the healthy ones question jail if this was really the right decision. They aren't bothered if they give the leftovers to the old or young, but that guy, it was evident that he's going to die soon. The wound is already rotting, it's even a miracle that he was still alive, because with the state he was in now, he should have died already. They don't even know how he keeps up without falling behind. But even with this fact, Jail's belief remained the same. This wasn't just out of sympathy, but because the wounded lizard man named Rakrak was the only one who had faced a saber-toothed tiger when everyone else turned their backs and ran away. Thanks to Rakrak, there was no other damage to the group other than his wounds. If it wasn't for Rakrak, many would have died or gotten injured, and in the worst case scenario, the whole group could have fallen apart. And of course, the others understood this, and appreciated what Rakrak has done, but the fact still remains that he is going to die soon, and there's not enough food to share with, to which Jarl exclaimed to them that they are being shameless, ungrateful. Son of a lizard, but they don't seem to mind her remarks as they care more about logical reasoning. Still, even with such arguments, they decided to go with Jail's reasoning as it can be seen. That Rakrak was still in the group. However, with the group lying near with each other, Rakrak just lay on the corner all alone. And because of his injuries, it made it hard for him to sleep comfortably. However, this also allowed him to immediately notice the blue butterfly just flying around. Above him, and looking at it with curiosity, it led him to see the top of a hill, illuminated with a shining light, and with nothing else to do. Rakrak had stood up and followed the strange light, and seeing him walk in the middle of the night, made others assume that he is finally leaving the group. Still, it was his own decision to do this, so no one stopped him, and they were just fixated on what he was about to do next. While Rakrak on the other hand, was grasping on the last purpose he had left in this cruel life of his, and that is to follow what seemed to be a glimpse of hope, but as he ascend, he was wondering if this was just a deranged fantasy of his, and the fact that he was the only one who reacted to seeing it. It might really be the case, and even if what he is seeing right now means something, he wonders what on earth would that be and where it would lead him to, but he doesn't have to wonder for long. As soon as he arrived at the top of the hill, his eyes widened with surprise, as a hill of beetles just erected like a tower. It was enough for the entire group to satiate their hunger. With this, a system message appeared in front of Nebula, notifying him that the lizard men recognized this event to be a miracle, which he was relieved to see, and seeing that other lizard men enjoyed his gift. The next step is to make them realize this miracle was done by him, and let them know his name. His divinity, to his surprise, it seems like he doesn't have to, since Rakrak decided 
to announce the miracle himself, which was understandable, as individual with high willpower, tend to take care of things on their own. Unexpectedly, with the beetle on Rack Rack's hand, they decided to recognize his divinity. As the nameless, beetle god, which surprised him, as he had expected them to name it Butterfly. At the least, since he had used butterflies to guide them for all this time. But beetle god is still fine, and he understood that no one has a great name from the beginning. So he lets it be. And as he looks over them, Nebula couldn't contain his smile, because he acknowledges. That Rack Rack will be important to him. Of course that goes for Rack Rack as well. The next day arrived, Rack Rack had seen butterflies again. Still, he contemplated to following it again, while his lizard kind on the other hand was excited to know he is seeing butterflies, as this was a sign that they were going to have a full stomach. However, this time, he was hesitant to chase his fantasy right away. Until now, they were in great debt to the swarms of beetles. However, the beetles could be leading them to a trap if one looked at the matter from another perspective, especially when winter is coming soon, and beetles would appear from the cold directions on the north, so if they head in the direction where the beetles came, they will surely freeze to death, and hearing his reasonings, this made the others immediately change their mind on feasting on beetles, and just go to a different direction. But even though this was the logical solution, Rack Rack felt that they shouldn't do that, because there is nothing in the opposite direction as well. However, he also admits that he doesn't have a clue on what purpose is there in the fantasy he was seeing, but for now, he just doesn't have any other choice but to follow. Meanwhile, Nebula saw everything and noticed that they are losing faith. Still he understood that it's just the beginning, so it was reasonable for them to lack faith. And there is nothing he could do, but if he were to be specific, he would rather hear a logical leader than a leader who was blinded by faith. However, if Rack Rack would continue believing in him, he is sure to make Rack Rack experience a future that he could never imagine. And just as Nebula wanted, Rack Rack's tribe walked through the path he had paved, and they then began to climb a small hill that rose past the wilderness, and as they climbed the hill, their eyes began to widen as they couldn't believe what was in front of them. And seeing that everyone was too stunned to say anything, Rack Rack turned towards the group and proclaimed that the nameless beetle god has yet again gave them another miracle, as he brought them to a sanctuary, where thick bushes and trees circled the wide spring, from which small waterfalls and streams flowed. With this, everyone cheered with joy from the top of their lungs, celebrating the glimpse of hope of survival that was given to them by believing in Rack Rack's decision. At the same time, Nebula's divinity level increased to level 2, and his level of small area has also increased to 2, with this, Blessings of Bug's ability is now available, and this was such an important skill to have, because in the game The Lost World, it was possible to grant a special ability to the believers, who supported the small area, once the players. Small area leveled up. This was called God's blessing, and it allows the believers to evolve, as the blessings would change the appearance of the species, and the change would be passed down to the descendants. And if his hunch were right, Rack Rack would know for sure what he wanted, and so Nebula decided to bless Rack Rack and him his priest, in order to deliver his will to his people. A few moments later, the day turned into night, the lizard men sleep peacefully under the clear night sky, and because Rack Rack was now a priest, Nebula is now able to get inside his dreams, and show himself to him but with a more familiar persona akin to Rack Rack's species. And for this, Rack Rack had so much things to ask, but before he could say anything, Nebula just stretched out his arm, like he was asking Rack Rack to hold it, but as Nebula expected, Rack Rack was insightful. He knew exactly that it wasn't what he wanted, so Rack Rack remained still, prompting Nebula to shift his outstretched arm to point at something below, to Rack Rack's surprise. He was now holding a buffalo skull, and somehow, he then lifted it up like he had been doing this for countless of times, and placed it on the nameless beetle god's head. With this, the image of their god became clear to him, and so as soon as the day arrived, he gathered everyone, and with every detail he told them what exactly he had dream of. And in hearing this, the more insightful lizard men had deduced that the message of the beetle God he had seen in his dreams was clear, and that he is asking for them to sacrifice a buffalo. However, to hunt a buffalo, they have to go deep into the wilderness, which is just too big of a risk for jail. 
however, the others had different opinion of what she just said, as they believed they have a duty to fulfill, since the one who brought them to the sanctuary had personally asked for it. But even with this reasoning, Jail's decision remained the same, as she just doesn't want to put their pack in danger, which they understand where she is coming from, and so they suggest that perhaps all pack of hunters should step forward and join the hunt, to which Jal immediately disagree, as it was a stupid suggestion, because if they do just that, who will be left to protect the others who are weakened, this argument left the others unable to think of any alternative ways, and so it seems like they were in a predicament. But to their surprise, Rakrak -rak also agreed to Jail's concern. He was a great leader. He isn't willing to put the whole pack in danger as well, so he suggested that he will go alone. This instantly surprised everyone. Even Jal couldn't stand what Rakrak -rak had just suggested, because they know for a fact that it is near impossible to catch a buffalo alone, seeing them worried like this. Rakrak -rak clarified that he decided this not because he was being reckless, but because God had given him a blessing. This initially confused Jal, and so Rakrak -rak enlightened them about what he just said, explaining to them about how he encountered another unbelievable miracle. When he woke up, his wound has completely healed, and his shoulders were all covered with black scales, just like a beetle, and seeing this with their own eyes. Jal admits that what happened to him is a bit strange. However, this isn't enough of a reason to go hunting buffalo alone, which Rakrak -rak agreed as well, because the real reason is the massive strength he now acquired. To demonstrate this, he hurled a spear to a tree, and penetrated hard, hard enough for it to shatter within contact, this display instantly left all the lizard men in shock. And in disbelief. The impact was so forceful that all that remained on the tree was its bark, leaving the lizard men in awe. With this, they eagerly inquired if Rakrak -rak had been concealing this extraordinary power. Even though it was a lifeless tree, the showcase strength exceeded their capabilities. So it became apparent that the Rakrak -rak they thought they knew really had undergone a remarkable transformation, but as they marveled at Rakrak's -rak's newfound skill on the horizon, their intended prey emerged and sprinted toward them. Rakrak, -rak, seizing the opportunity, announced it with enthusiasm, leaving the lizard men in shock, as they couldn't believe such coincidence to happen, because a herd of buffalo always moves to the same place. It makes no sense to get lost and come all the way here, but now, it seems like their previous argument was pointless after all, because their god really wanted that offering. And so without moment's hesitation, Rakrak -rak charged to the herd of buffalo and skillfully hurled his spear into the midst of the group, striking with precision, the first buffalo, once feared by the lizard men, fell before their eyes. This boosted the lizard men's morale, and so they eagerly joined Rakrak -rak in a unified attack on the buffalo. A few moments later, the day turned into night once again, but now with the countless buffalo. Slade, they had managed to create an altar with bones, and in the top of it was a whole buffalo ready to be offered to the nameless beetle god, and with Rakrak's -rak glib tongue, he uttered the right words to consecrate the offering, and others followed suit, and although it is a sloppy and clumsy ritual for Nebula's eyes, the sincerity behind it was what mattered. So Nebula was able to gain faith beyond his expectations. It was a decent rite, as a novice priest, and now that Nebula thinks of the time he put into it, it was worth doing this much. He couldn't control the buffalo, as he wasn't the god of wild grass that a buffalo eats. So it took him time and effort from other friends of his, the grasshopper, he set them up as a trap, and so as soon as the buffalo got to eat it, he had managed to control it. Somehow. However, it seems like the lizard ate the baby buffalo as well. Still this was reasonable, because at this stage, it is difficult to expect they already have knowledge and skills equivalent to herding, but still their ignorance was too much. So it seems like the lizard men are still savages, and the population support of this oasis is not very high, at most, the limit will be a few years, so in their current state, with their primitive ass, who doesn't know anything about farming or ranching, it is bound that they will face difficulty to get through a calamity. However, even if he realized this, he understood that it is still very difficult to realize certain knowledge on your own, and it's not okay to say it directly either because it violates the law of causality, but it's not that there is no way, it will just take some time. 
So if that's the case, then first thing he has to do is starting by giving a blessing. With this, another light shined towards Rakrak. A few days had passed, the altar they had previously built had grew larger as they have. Hunted more buffaloes, but what's even more surprising was the significant change Rakrak. Had gone through, because of the blessing that Nebula gave, Rakrak and his men had. Evolved and had now black scales like the beetle they had consumed, but even with this. Rakrak was troubled, as he had a disturbing dream in previous night, and he doesn't know. What it meant, as the vision was ambiguous, were the altar, once a symbol of prosperity. Now shook precariously in the unsettling dream, the pond of blessings, which had protected. Them for many years, had lost its vitality, no more fish thrived in its once teeming. Waters, and the ground had become so parched that no root plants could be found, which seems to be a dire dream. However, JL pointed out that it will be a long time before that happens, indicating that he shouldn't worry that much, especially because the god takes care of them, which Rakrak agreed, as believe in God too, more than anyone else, but the gods will often come across as difficult for them to understand, so if the leader is lacking in understanding its meaning, there will come a time that they will betray God's will, and he is afraid of that happening, and so he ponders hard on what his vision had shown him and find out the meaning of it. To his surprise, he doesn't have to wonder for long, as he saw a large group emerging from the horizon. With this, they now know why the altar shook, it was to warn them about the arrival of their enemy, and looking at them closely, there was no doubt that these guys are the ones who kicked them out, and this was obvious as the leader had blue scale like them from before. And above all, the large monster that only the leader could tame was with them, solidifying their recognition, and looking at the numbers, it looks like the entire tribe has arrived. That could mean that their hometown, a wetland with green leather, was completely devastated. This really grinded Rakrak's gear, and the only possible explanation Jal could come up with was that the large monster was high maintenance that it depleted their resources at a much faster rate. Nonetheless, they were confident that they will not be able to locate their sanctuary. Since it is located on terrain that cannot be seen until you climb up, so there is a possibility that they may pass by without knowing, however, this didn't go as they had hoped for, as the ones who were in patrol, led by Yur, exposed their presence, by boldly shouted at the approaching tribe to stop their advances, as this was the sanctuary of the nameless beetle avatar, so they better not take a single step in their turf. However, this only fueled curiosity on the other side. Even Rakrak couldn't believe the stupidity of yours, still he told Jal not to worry. Since this may also be God's arrangement, which confused Jal, so she asked what he meant by that. In response, Rakrak explained that he believed that God deliberately caused this situation. This led Jal to assume he meant it was a test from God, but Rakrak clarified that it might not be a test but rather a mission, a mission to accept and save those who were once part of their community. But even if that were the case, Jal remained concerned, since they know all too well that the leader of their previous tribe is just ruthless, he didn't even think twice to drive out the weak tribe into the wilderness, so changing the leader's mind is just impossible. However, as they ponder this, the blue butterfly appeared in front of Rakrak once more, a clear sign of God's will, with this, he realizes that it was foolish for them to dare to think beyond their scope, as they don't have the ability to see the future, and speculating here about what will happen wouldn't get them anywhere. So the only thing they can do right now is to do what they can, and that is to face their adversaries. Meanwhile, Nebula was delighted to see that Rakrak understood exactly what he meant. Rakrak's tribe and the Blue High tribe must be united for population growth and technological advancement. But what's a bit strange is that Rakrak made that decision on his own. This led Nebula to believe that this was because of Rakrak's high will power, and a leader with high self will is a good thing for Nebula, and only thing he wished now is. If only he could instill a firm belief with this, he would be allowed to control everything individually, and he will be able to express his intentions more efficiently. However, Nebula acknowledged that such developments would take time and a higher level of influence. For now, he resolved to concentrate on the impending battle, and just as expected, the cunning leader of the Blue Lizard Man had decided to use his sly mouth to get more information out of the stupid Lizard Man, and with every mock, yours group revealed more and more information 
about their place, and when the leader was just about to think he got the best of them. When he didn't expect to writhe and answered his domineering question, but with a more confidence and conviction, Rakrak -rak had also revealed that their place had an avatar. Rakrak's demeanor exude of that of a leader, and so the blue leader had withdrawn his mocking voice and asked seriously what Rakrak -rak meant by an avatar, prompting Rakrak -rak to explain that this place is the domain of the nameless beetle avatar. However, the blue guy doesn't believe in such thing, and with this, he discerned that the leader in front of him is just delusional like the others, and so he regained back his domineering tone and looked down on Rakrak's tribe once more, and then with exuding audacity. He demanded that they leave, assuring them that if they departed immediately, he wouldn't launch an attack. The disdainful attitude even extended to the mount, looking at them as if they were trash. And if that wasn't menacing enough, he confidently asserted that they stood no chance against him, boasting of his countless followers, and according to him, if Rakrak -rak were truly a leader, he should have already calculated by now the undeniable truth of his words. Much to the blue leader's surprise, Rakrak -rak merely shook his head and aimed his spear towards the blue guy, indicating that he is willing to fight him, this in turn caught the blue guy off guard, but even before he could say anything, Rakrak -rak turned his attention to those who followed the blue leader. Attempting to reason with them, he extended an invitation for them to join Rakrak's tribe, promising that under God's protection, they would be cared for according to his will. However, definitely this only made the blue leader laugh hysterically, as he saw what Rakrak -rak was spouting was all bullshit, so it seems like there was no point in them talking. As they were all foolish in the blue guy's eyes, but Rakrak -rak said nah -huh, you don't know God, and now look at this spear, it's sharp, which taken aback the blue leader, because the spear was indeed sharp, but what concerned the blue guy more, is that this Rakrak -rak just kept talking nonsense, he definitely crazy, and so he decided to attack this foolish lizard. And as the blue guy attack, Rakrak -rak prayed to his god to give him courage and strength to defeat the enemy in front of him, however, to his dismay, his god responded. Psyche thought, as the spear that he was holding just shattered on impact, with this. He knew it was all over, and so he freezed up, however, before this happened, a system interface popped up in front of Nebula, since two different tribes came into contact, experience. Points for both tribes increased significantly, subsequently, this triggered another system interface to pop up, and since he had been paying a lot of attention to one tribe, these tribes are now part of his territory, with this, another skill was available for Nebula to use, which he didn't think twice to use because of his current circumstance, with this, before the large monster's attack could land, a beam of bright light suddenly fell directly on Rakrak, -rak. with this, he was able to dodge the upcoming attack, as he was now exuding a great amount of mana, since he is now one with Nebula, as he had took over his consciousness, meanwhile, the blue guy doesn't have a single clue on what happened. Still he tries to attack Rakrak -rak once more, but Nebula who is in Rakrak's -rak body just looked at his attempt with an indifferent expression, and their movement was just so slow to him. And so Nebula got time to open the blue guy's status window to see his strength, to Nebula's. Surprise, Rakrak -rak alone could manage to defeat this fool, so it seemed like the only reason he was losing was because of the little drake monster, as it had 87 strength beyond what Rakrak -rak has. But with the blessing, it's not difficult anymore, and so Nebula dashed towards the drake, which caught the drake of guard of how fast he was, this was possible. Because the skill, strong avatar, gives the user an additional stat called divinity, 1. Divinity equals 200 times the maximum value of power that can exist naturally, to put. It simply, the power of Rakrak -rak now is 630, and so Nebula easily slapped the drake's face into the ground, flipping them like they were pancakes, this shocked everyone, as they couldn't even believe it was possible, this overwhelming difference in power was just out of this world. Even Rakrak's own tribesman who was used to Rakrak's strength was in shock, and so. Silence followed, as they were all too stunned to say anything, but now that the threat was gone, Rakrak's men was about to celebrate, however, it seems like Rakrak remained indifferent. So they halted their celebration, meanwhile, the blue guy was in disbelief himself, he can't grasp the fact that he was defeated, his calculations were never wrong, and the only conclusion he could make was that Rakrak -rak had pulled a trick from his ass, and so he attempted another attack on Rakrak, -rak, 
but little did he knew, Nebula was still in control of Rackrack's body, and Nebula doesn't give a shit, so he clapped the blue guy so hard that his head was now facing the other way around, killing him on the spot, after that display. With a cold tone, he asks the others if they would also like to try his hands, but who in the right mind would do that, and so they let go of their weapons and swear allegiance to Rackrack and his tribe, and seeing that they have completely submitted Nebula leave Rackrack's body, and therefore Rackrack regained his consciousness, still, he knew what had happened and can't believe that it did just happen, the avatar just come in his body. And he felt he was dreaming, a few moments later, the day turned into night once more. But the paradise they live was livelier than before, as the countless of lizard men had gained their numbers, and amidst of it, same conversation can be heard, the new lizard. Men couldn't believe that what in front of them is the same tribe who went out into the wilderness as they now have a different color, prompting them to explain that it was because they are following the nameless beetle avatar, that's why they change and became stronger, if this didn't happen, they would have died wandering in the wilderness. With this story, the new tribe folks now know the strength of the avatar, even their leaders. Strength was out of this world, as this happened, Rackrack was just sitting with JOL contemplating about something, but his trains of thought was disrupted by JL asking him if their current predicament was okay, because with him accepting the others, their population has increased sixfold. With this, the place they are staying at will rapidly deteriorate. Which he knows all too well, that is also the reason he was thinking so hard in silence. But the only option he could think now was that they have to leave this place, which surprised JOLL as they couldn't just wander around the wilderness without any answers. To which Rackrack responded that it wasn't the case, because he feels it, the answers will definitely lie within them, the answers sent by God through their old brothers. The next day had arrived, Rackrack's tribesman is trying to tame the little drake monster, however. It seems like they were having a hard time at it, they even tried to convince it by telling that its master is dead so it should just submit, but expectedly, with this foolishness of theirs, the drake whipped its tail to retaliate, almost hitting one of the lizard dude, and initially they stood their ground, but it quickly became clear that the drake was not taking them seriously, as it tried to be cheeky and launched itself to them. Luckily for them, the beast was tied to a tree, still they knew that if they prolong this further, the beast will just get away, and for that, they loudly asked it if it really want to get scolded, because they will do just that if it keeps this up. However, the situation shifted dramatically with Rackrack's arrival, the drake, vividly recalling Rackrack's previous actions, instinctively retreated, contrary to its expectations, Rackrack approached with a calm demeanor, offering the drake something, even the drake was shocked to see the guy who can just kill him, in an instant would be this gentle, and so little by little. The drake accepted Rackrack's offer, even the others were in shock to see the fierce drake. To immediately change to a more domesticated stance, it has even extended its head for Rackrack to pat as if it was asking for more, with this, Rackrack gave it more as a reward. For being well behaved, which the creature accepted without hesitation, and this gesture of Rackrack stemmed from a belief that there must be a significant reason for the god to spare the drake's life, and with this, the drake looked at Rackrack in a different light, and was now comfortable with Rackrack that it even tried to ask for more, and seeing this change, Rackrack playfully teased to give more, but unfortunately, he revealed that he couldn't, because if he did just that, their food supply will deplete, leaving them with nothing left to eat, and if it really wants them to be together in the future, it needs to be patient. Surprisingly, the little drake named Monin had understood Rackrack's policy, and so it just lie and wait for another treat to come. With this, Rackrack's job here was done, and so he prepared to depart, however before leaving, he turned to his subordinates with a final instruction, he emphasized that if Monin caused any further trouble, they were to inform him without delay, which they understood. Then, a few moments had passed, Rackrack was now meeting with his other tribesmen, and he is inspecting a well-crafted blade made by one of them, which impressed him so it led him to ask the guy if he is able to replicate this quality again, to which he proudly claims that he can every time for that matter, and if it weren't for their previous leader's stubbornness. He would have made better blades a long time ago, this piqued Rackrack's interest, and so 
he asks the man the reason why their leader opposed to making such a well-crafted item. In response, the man explained that it was because of the trees. In the process of making this blade, they have to use a lot of wood, rack rack initially. Clueless about crafting weapons. He asks if this was made under the heat of a bonfire, to which the man clarified that. It isn't, and that they have to burn the wood first to make the special fuel needed. To make these things. With that clarified, Rack Rack now knows that making these weapons are costly. Still he isn't willing to be like the previous leader, who is afraid of change and just outright. Refuse a great opportunity for their tribe. So he told the man who is full of scars, to wait tomorrow as he needed to further think. Of this before making a decision, which the man understood quite well, and so he left. In silence. After that, a lizard with a single arm comes in, and it seems like he was here since he heard Rack Rack is looking for a guide. Without a doubt on Rack Rack's mind he must be a wanderer, to which the guy confirmed, and he had been wandering from quite some time, hopping from place to place in the hopes of finding a place that he could call home, and because of this, he learned to see the way. A path that leads to a land that won't let them go hungry. He have a few place in mind, however, he can't guarantee whether it will still be the same. This intrigued Rack Rack, so he asked if other tribesmen and wanderers can be located in there as well, to which the guy confirmed. So if that's the case, there is no reason for them not to go there, and if the inhabitants of that place are against them, all they have to do is defeat them and take over the lands. Which the guy agreed that it is a sound decision, and if that's his will, he should follow it. Without hesitation. Now that was settled, Rack Rack asked the guy, how can he give him faith in his abilities? which shocked the guy as this was the first time a leader took interest in learning his ability. In turn, he immediately pointed up above and told them that his answer always come from them, which Rack Rack initially thought the guy was talking about the sky, which the guy corrected. That it's not just the sky, but a sky full of stars, and with that, they waited for a few hours to pass so that the wanderer could explain in detail what he meant, and as night fell, Rack Rack looked up at the stars, and because this was his first time intently observing them, his curiosity peaked, leading him to ask the wanderer if the stars were moving. To which the wanderer responded that it could be possible, but he isn't entirely sure. As he haven't fully grasped the rules governing the skies above them, but he had set some rules that he must follow, because if one knows the path of the stars to take, one could follow the path of man without being confused, and since Rack Rack doesn't know how to do that. Just yet, Wanderer will tell him the way of the stars this instant, and if they practice this for a few days, he will gain faith in this ability. With that, the Wanderer began to impart his knowledge about the vast universe surrounding them, and after spending some time in this enlightening exchange, the Wanderer concluded his lesson for the day, and planned to continue at the next day at the same time. However, Rackrack's duty as a leader was not finished, because you're the dude who was assigned to take care of the Drake had appeared, and so, Rack Rack instantly inquired if he is here because Manun is causing trouble again, to which you're clarified that it wasn't the case, because even though Manun seems a little dissatisfied, since he has been giving him meals on time, he became more gentle. This was such a great news for Rack Rack, as he had one less thing to take care of. However, the guy wasn't here to report just that, he was here to suggest an idea, as he had heard JL said, they need a way to move around without starving, so when he watched him tame Monin with snacks, he suddenly thought of something. If it was possible to tame Manun, it is also possible that they could tame something else. This intrigued Rack Rack once more, and so he asks the guy to broad his explanation and give example, leading him to point at far below, onto the herd of buffalo. And with this, a system interface had popped up, notifying Nebula that Rack Rack's tribe had just learned the ability to herd. This made Nebula think about history, and it is said that in human history, splits into two branches at some point, one to do farming, the other is to do pastoralism. Although the source of this information is from the game, he believes that it is illogical to go with this notion, as this reality was from the game he played, but now that it comes into mind, he believes that farming would be more stable. In fact, major civilizations also started with this, but the tribe he chose was the lizard man, with a strong physique, and high environmental adaptability, so what they need more is to be a pastoral society rather than farming. 
and in this pack, the technology that will give them wings is ironware. Luckily, Rack Rack had already approved using tons of wood for the smithy to get into motion. And coupled with the guy's technique which he crafted for many years. It was just a matter of time and effort that they finally made batches of well-sharpened blades, which Nebula was glad to see. For now, it may be softer than well-processed bronze ware, but for Rack Rack's tribe who had no choice but to use stone tools, it will be a great help. Also, he had another unexpected gain. This guy, Wanderer, and his knowledge of astronomy. Of course it is still too primitive to be called astronomy, but in the distant future. He hoped that they put it into good use. And with that, the Wanderer taught Rack Rack more about of this stars that they didn't. Even notice how much time had passed, but because of it, Rack Rack had more of an idea. Of what the stars hold. And he was engrossed with this knowledge that he can't look away and just continue. To stare above, but now that his men had gave him so much, it was time for him to do what? He can as the leader of the tribe. With this in mind, he had gathered his tribe's men in the center of the sanctuary and give a speech about their current circumstance, and that it has been a long time since God brought them to this land. They even met their brothers again, but they could have kicked them like what they did to them. They could have chosen to live on their own. Then they could have lived for a longer time in this land. But of course those who were kicked out would have died in the wilderness. And that was wrong, because their God wanted salvation, not exclusion. That is because it benefits more people. This speech of his had moved the hearts of the people, and seeing this effect, Rack Rack took this opportunity to tell them what they must do, and that is to leave this place. By dawn. This in turn shocked the people, but Rack Rack told them not to worry, because they are not going to wander aimlessly like last time, because they have Stargazer. This man has been telling him the movements of the stars for several days, and he had confirmed that what this person said was true, and so he was proud to announce that this man, which he now calls Stargazer, will be their guide. From now on, they will entrust the Stargazer to guide their path. But Rack, Rack knew that his words would not be enough to convince all of his people, and so he asked Stargazer to explain and demonstrate to everyone where he will be leading them which Stargazer didn't hesitate to do just that. Telling them that after dawn, when the morning sun rises, they will head to the right side of the sun, and they will keep walking for ten days straight, then another fifteen days. To the right again along a rotten lake, and three days more on a desolate mountain paths and valley paths. After walking like that, they will find their destination, where an endless forest will greet them. There will be many beasts there, and it's an area where there are packs of other races. As well. This meant that it is a good area to live in. Now that was cleared up, Rack Rack thanked Stargazer for the explanation, and then continued his speech by climbing the altar to make a statement. And now that all their attention was on him, he asked you loudly, why he didn't eat any water buffalo they caught yesterday, and this was so sudden that your was so caught off. Guard that he doesn't know how to respond, but seeing Rack Rack just stand there on the altar. Menacingly. He knew that he should take this question as serious as possible, and if he lied right. Now it would be the end of him. And so even though he was nervous, he used his trembling voice to answer Rack Rack's inquiry. As truthful as possible. Explaining why he didn't eat a boar yesterday was because he wasn't hungry. Leading Rack Rack to point out that everyone worked hard to catch that water buffalo, and yet. He didn't eat any, which in turn made you more nervous from before, but he knew that. If he doesn't say anything now, the others will think that he did this to disrespect. Them. And so he gathered all his courage to clarify that he acknowledged that everyone worked. Hard, but he just wasn't particularly hungry. And he was thinking that if he holds back now, then maybe later he could eat it when he is. Really hungry. And this is just what Rack Rack wanted to hear. And so he praised you for a job well done. This in turn shocked everyone. Even you couldn't comprehend what just happened. He thought he was getting grilled, but it turns out he was doing good. And seeing their confused faces, Rack Rack explained why he just complimented him, and that he appreciated his action because he was thinking of the future. And this was an excellent mindset to have. So he asks you again if this will continue to be the case, which you are gladly responded. That it is. And as long as he doesn't starve, he would continue to do that. And with that, Rack Rack decided to compensate him, 
with the spear they just made, shocking. Everyone yet again. But even before they could respond, the spear was immediately handed to Yor, which in turn made his eyes widen with awe as the spear shines, a testament of how well crafted it was. Another revelation had surprised them yet again, because those who followed Yor's words and those who resisted their desire to eat what they wanted were also worthy to be given a spear. This really made the group happy, and looking at how awesome they look with the spear. The others were starting to contemplate on following what Yor had just done. While Jol on the other hand was relieved to see that this was what Rakrak decided. Setting an example for their people to follow. But to her surprise, Rakrak wasn't done, as he then took a skull from the altar to wear.